in the state of Montana now. And so my reservation is located at the bottom of the map. We border the Wyoming um, state line and the yellow is a uh, territory in which we traveled around um, before, uh, before we were placed on a reservation. And so this, this map is showing the, the boundaries as defined by the Fort Laramie Treaty in 1851. And so uh, as Sean stated, I went to Montana State, did, um, about a three hours drive away from my reservation. Um, and I, when I went to undergrad, I started taking Native Studies classes. And um, this is the first time, uh, I, I was actually really intrigued well, I was like, what is a native, native studies class? Is it, is it just a place that I can go and it will be like an easy A because <laughs> it's about native people and I'm a native person. Um, so I've really had no clue. Um, but the things that were discussed were um, like why native people are on reservations. And that, that had been nothing that I had ever questioned ever. That, cause that was my normal. So there, there uh, was never, a time when I ever questioned that or in conversation, my dad, he actually got my grandfather's land out of lease. Um, and he would talk about the different allotments. And so um, that was a term that I was not aware of until I started taking these native studies classes. And so with that, um, I became really interested in the history of my own community, um, knowing about our history and um, also knowing about our history in um, the US government. And that's when I learned about this guy, his name is Sits in the Middle of the Land. And he was a Crow chief around the uh, mid uh, 1800s. And he was the one who told the US government uh, where Crow territory was. And he used this beautiful metaphor. He said, my home is where my teepee sits. And I got really intrigued by that. I was like, where, where is he going with this? My home is where my teepee sits. And basically what he did was uh, the way that Crow set up our teepees is we use these four foundation poles. And then we set the rest of the poles up on them in the cover. And he took those four foundation poles and then he placed them um, in places uh, metaphorically that we uh, travel major uh, migration routes that we travel throughout the seasons. Um, and so basically placing them on these four major routes. And he said, uh, that is where Crow territory is. My home is where my teepee sits. And that mapped out, I believe 38.5 million acres of land. And just to like envision that, like thinking of the land as a giant teepee was super powerful. But then when I took a closer look, I realized that where I was going to school was actually in Crow country. And I got um, really excited about this. And I called up my dad and I said, you know, I'm, I'm in Crow country. And um, I said, I, I, I want to do something about this. I want to like celebrate, celebrate that fact, celebrate my ancestors. But I also want to let the, the community of Bozeman know that they're on, on Crow land. And so I thought of um, harvesting lodge poles from my reservation and then setting up teepees on campus. And so this is like the first uh, installation that I did. And I wanted to show how you set up a Crow teepee. So there's those four foundation poles and then there's the rest of the poles on that foundation and then the cover. And then from there on, I started scouting out different prime pieces of real, real estate on campus. Those, those pieces of land that the students use to cut across as shortcuts. And I would stick my teepees right on top of their pathway. And then I would just sort of watch and see, you know, how people interacted with these structures. And sometimes they would like walk around them. Sometimes they would walk through them. Uh, this is another installation spot. And this happened to be right by this co-ed dorm, which is that large building in the background. And these pieces would take me pretty much all day to set up. And I usually had help. I would wrangle some friends or sometimes my parents would come and help me. 
Um, but these poles are each about 35 feet long. They're quite tall um, and uh, quite awkward when you try to erect them. And so this particular piece took me about um, six or eight hours to set up. And then I went home and then the next day I came back and they were all knocked down. And so I thought, well, perhaps it was the wind. And so I set them back up again and then came back the next day and they were knocked down. And I thought, well, I don't think this is the wind anymore. So what if I just build a giant lodge and put all the poles on them? And so I spent all day doing that and I came back and it was knocked down again. So then I just decided, well, I'll just uh, set them up on the football field on the 50 yard line. And I love to show this work because um, it really speaks to the foundation of my practice in which I tend to be intrigued by say a historical photo or I have a, a particular question that like comes up and then I'll try to answer that question through digging into different um, archives, um, various, um, various uh, bits of research to then like figure out or answer that question. And then through that, I produce um, a vision, sort of a, a visual record of that research. And so this is a very important work for me. I was invited to have an exhibition at the Q Foundation. I believe this was in like 2017. I'm getting really bad at like mixing up these dates. It seems like a whole century ago. Um, in the Q Foundation, it's spelled uh, C-U-E, is a, a great uh, nonprofit gallery space and an artist, they have a program where artists can apply to have an exhibition and they'll pair you with a curator. So for instance, for this show, I was paired with Michelle Grabner. Or if you are a curator, you can propose um, an exhibition with an artist um, and go that route. And so my idea for the show was to um, focus on this event, this cultural event that happens on my reservation called Crow Fair. Um, and it happens every third week in August and it started in 1904. And um, Crow Fair was actually um, started by the US government as a way to get crows to start farming, to assimilate into Western culture and work the land. And so they modeled this fair after like the Midwest fairs like in Iowa and Nebraska, hoping that um, the crows would then like bring their produce and their prized uh, livestock and the women would make jams and you know all sorts of craft projects and then they would get prizes. But knowing that that wouldn't be uh, that interesting for my community, um, they decided to loosen some of the restrictions that were happening to all native people at that time, which was anything um, cultural, anything that would promote the culture, the language, anything like that. And so they loosened some of that up for this event. And uh, what we added was our dancing and um, a parade and, uh, where we got to wear our regalia. And so for this particular project, I decided I wanted to focus specifically on the parade aspect of Crow Fair. And I forgot to tell you, Crow Fair is known as the TP capital of the world. And it's held in Crow Agency, Montana. And every family sets up a camp and then there is um, a powwow grounds where dancing happens. There's also rodeo um, and there's a parade that happens every morning. And so what I did was I wanted to find as many different photos as I could of the different decades of Crow Fair, starting with my own personal photos to my family's photos and then diving into public archives. I'm gonna just show a little bit of a video, but not too much because I don't wanna make you motion sick. And so um, I started the timeline, I believe in 2016 with photos from 2016. And then I um, printed them out and cut them out. And I um, created this timeline. I just wanna get to this woman at the end.
Um, and so the other thing that I did with this timeline was I um, wrote directly on the wall. There's my kiddo right there. Anybody's name who I recognize, um, any action that they were doing. Uh, let's see if I can get a sweet spot. Um, any article of clothing that I wanted to talk about a little bit more, I would write directly on the wall. And so there's this is my daughter when she was five. Um, and um, this woman right here, I wanted to include, her name's Win Winona Plenty Hoops. And the reason why I included her was because she's my grandma's generation. And um, she's the last generation who dressed in the sort of old school or old style way of dressing where the women would uh, make their own dresses. They'd wear these high top leather moccasins and these um, big thick uh, belts that they would often like carve in floral designs and then they'd wear these scarves. And um, grow growing up, I would see women dressed in this sort of old school way. And now when I go to the reservation, no one dresses this way anymore. So it was really important for me to include her. And then the other thing is that she actually shows up in the timeline again in 1910 as a small girl. So I'll see if I can um, catch that. Um, so this is the, the 90s and I, I rule in the 90s. There's lots of photos of me in the 90s, 1910. This is my grandma in the 1920s. Um, and we're, I believe we're in the 1910s right now. And here's Winona Plenty Hoops right here with the rest of her family. And so when I set up this timeline, it was like this really incredible experience to be in the space. And then I could like crisscross across the room and find like people at different ages and different stages of their life. I could also see the culture and um, ways that we had adapted things and ways that we had just kept uh, certain cultural aspects have remained the same. And it, and it gave me a, a lot of hope in the resiliency of our culture. Um, here's a, here are some uh, just details from the timeline. And this is my grandma, Amy Brighton's Red Star. She was born uh, June 20th, 1920. And these smaller photos here are actually slides that my dad took in the 70s and 60s. And I started the timeline with my daughter uh, because she is the next generation that will hopefully continue this tradition forward. So just to give you a sense of the, this, the context of Crow Fair, this, here are some images uh, of my family's camp. And uh, what you're looking at here is sort of the kitchen, the living room and the major gossip center. And every camp has this sort of area. You might've noticed that um, a lot of the dresses had these sort of white dot looking things. And those are actually symbolize elk teeth or at one point they were elk teeth and now they're all made out of resin, but there's only two eye teeth per elk. And what the dress is conveying is status and the hunting and trading abilities of the men. So the more um, elk teeth you have on the dress, the more uh, of the, the sort of the status that you have in that family. And typical dress tends to have anywhere to three to 500 teeth. This is my daughter at the, I think just after the parade uh, in our family float. And then I wanna show you just the actual parade itself. I don't think you can hear it, but that's it's okay. I just wanna show you.
And so my, my grandfather was born in 1907, my grandma 1920, my dad 1941, me 1981. And it's been in our families and, and that, those generations our entire life. So for me, when growing up, I thought, you know, Crow Fair had been happening forever since the dawn of time. <laughs> and I always participated in the parade. Um, and it wasn't until I did this project that I actually asked myself uh, and seeked out, like, why do we do this parade? Why do we wear our regalia and do this parade? And then I learned that actually what we're doing is we're symbolizing us moving every day to a new camp. And I just found that profoundly beautiful that, um, that I had been participating in this sort of very rich symbolism of us moving to a brand new camp every morning. In 2014, I had a solo exhibition at the Portland Art Museum. And around that time, there was a lot of talk about cultural appropriation when it came to native imagery. And I started thinking about how that like directly linked to my community. And immediately I thought of this chief of ours named Medicine Crow and these two images of him, this one and this one that basically had followed me around since I left the reservation. I first encountered these two images in undergrad. Um, and then I would often run into these images in random places, like at the airport. Here, here is Medicine Crow on this Indian spirit book. And then when I was at graduate school at UCLA, I used to go to Whole Foods just so I could get honest tea because he was on this honest tea bottle. And I found it actually very comforting. And I, you know, in, in a way, when I see his image or any crow's image, a historical image of a crow on a product, I am slightly comforted by it. And I think, you know, at that time when I was in Los Angeles, I didn't know any other crows that were there. And so um, to have this honest tea with medicine crow felt like a, a little bit like I was, had um, some company from home. And so I started thinking about this image and even Googled medicine crow. And I noticed that there were a ton of artists who had been making drawings of this image. Um, and his, he's got a descendant, I just want to explain. His name is Joseph Medicine Crow and he has passed, but he was an anthropologist and wrote a lot of books um, about Crow history and he was awarded a medal. And that's why you see Barack Obama in here. And so um, I decided, well, I want to investigate this these two photos because I had been enjoying them all these years. Um, it's such a powerful and striking image. Um, and to me, it's like, I always knew that was Medicine Crow and I, and I knew his descendants. And so, but I never had asked like, well, where did this photo uh, happen? Like, where was he at? Was this in Montana? And so it was just that simple question. And then I found out that they were delegation photos. Um, and they were taken by the U.S. government by a photographer named Charles Milton Bell. And he was the head photographer for the Bureau of Ethnology. And this was quite a common practice. It wasn't just my community who was traveling to Washington, D.C. to do business with the president, but several other Native communities were traveling there and they were also being photographed. So you can simply type in Native delegation photos and you'll see tons of images like this. And there's something very jarring about these images in, in the sense of uh, sort of the, the clashing of cultures that comes up. And so I was just blown away. I was like, well, it wasn't just Medicine Crow, there were five other chiefs that were with him. And some of these other chiefs I knew and some of, the, some of them I didn't know. And looking further into that, they had traveled there because the US government was trying to put a train through a large track of our hunting territory. They're also maybe thinking that it'd be easier just to move us to like North Dakota or South Dakota. <laughs> and we're like, no way, you know, this is, we're in Crow country. And so they were actually there for a couple months. Um, and um, 
now when I look at those images of Medicine Crow and the other images, what I am seeing is a form of like activism in that they were fighting for our community, our culture, our land, our language. And so that's, that's now what I see when I look at these photos. So this particular delegation trip that happened in 1880 was quite amazing in the fact that there is a lot of documentation around it. And one of the really cool things that came out of this trip was that Medicine Crow, who is right here, this is Medicine photo, um, when he returned home, there was a clerk that worked for the US government that uh, resided on the reservation named Charles Barstow. And he had this habit of having native people when, or crows, when they would come to do business. Um, and if they were waiting to talk to somebody, he would give them paper and then have them draw some of their experiences. So he asked Medicine Crow if he would draw from memory his trip to DC. So these are Medicine Crow's drawings. Here's a drawing of the Capitol. And I love, this is what I love about thinking about like a, his Crow perspective in that the way he was situating objects in the landscape and having a river sort of be the reference point. Here are some uh, different boats. I'm just blown away that this, he could remember all such detail. Three different types of trains. And then the other thing I started um, looking into was their clothing and what they were trying to articulate through their clothing. And basically they were saying um, their status as a chief or a bajet is how you say it in Crow and bajet translates basically to good man. And there are four major things you have to do in order to reach bajet status, which is uh, be the first in battle to touch an enemy warrior, taking a weapon from an enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat, stealing a horse from within an enemy camp, and leading a successful war party. And you had to do all four of those things and they had to be witnessed. And there were so many men who did maybe two or three, maybe none of them. And then um, basically different components of their outfit articulated these deeds. So for instance, the ermine, this is Old Crow, the ermine on his uh, war shirt represented that he captured a gun. If he had to earn it on his leggings, that meant that he uh, stole a horse. The different feathers represent different coups, like they were the first in battle to touch an enemy or that they led a successful war party. And then from there, um, once I started like looking into these chiefs, I started um, learning more about them, looking through census records. So in 1885, the Crow census, he was 50 years, he would have been 50 years old in this picture. He looks pretty good. Or 50 year old <laughs> and he was married to a woman at the that time named um, Pretty Medicine Pipe. He also participated in Buffalo Bill's Wild West in 1884. So I just started writing different things down and like tracing and outlining different components of their outfit and through that I would just start different details that I you know, wouldn't really have paid attention to if I ha wouldn't have made myself um, you know, actively outline areas of their, their outfit. And then with each chief, I learned something new that I never knew about. So Pretty Eagle, I actually realized that we're actually in the same clan. So he would be like a clan father to me. Um, but another thing I learned about him, which is quite terrible, is when he died, he was uh, buried in a wagon box, which was a popular way to bury important leaders of the time. And then his remains were actually stolen, along with several other uh, Crow people's remains and sold. And his remains actually ended up at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. And I had no idea about this. Um, but I did know about this place on our reservation called Pretty Eagle Point, where there's this bronze like teepee. But I just always knew, oh, there's Pretty Eagle Point or whatever. And it wasn't until I did this project that I, I learned that our 
tribe was actually able to get his remains back and then they buried him and they created this piece, this memorial piece called Pretty Eagle Point and that's where his remains were reburied. And I was just like, well, I was living this whole time and I didn't even know that history. Um, and that was a co common practice within the study of like anthropology and science was to collect native uh, um, skulls and study them because they thought they could determine like race um, based off of it. So there are uh, many, um, especially, well, people of color whose uh, bones are in these uh, institutions for that very purpose. This is two belly didn't know about until I did this project and um, he's actually wearing this uh, jacket that I'd never seen before. Um, and it's a floral style jacket with an otter fur trim. And uh, the Portland Art Museum has a collection of native objects and they have curl objects and they actually happen to have a very similar style jacket. And I was very impressed by the extreme saturated color. And it really made me think about, wow, could you imagine if this image was in color and the vibrancy you would see through that image? So I included this jacket and here he is, um, just as a reference point to, to kind of think about that. This is um, Chief Planku, and he actually was um, a chief in the dis district that I grew up on the reservation. And during their trip in Washington DC, since they were there for so long, they would often take them um, on trips to sort of entertain them. And one of the trips that they took them on was a trip to Washington's estate, Mount Vernon. And uh, pretty, I mean, uh, Plenty Coup was so impressed by Mount Vernon that um, when he returned to the reservations years later, he donated his allotted land to the state of Montana to create Chief, uh, um, uh, Chief Plenty Coup State Park. And I actually managed that for a year but it was because he was so <laughs> impressed by Washington's estate that he wanted to make a miniature Mount Vernon on our reservation. And so I just kind of got a kick out of walking around his park, which has his log cabin. Um, it's got a visitor center with a lot of his personal artifacts and other tribal members artifacts. Uh, but it all came from this experience he had going to Washington DC. And again, here's Medicine Crow. Another thing that really kind of threw me since I had been like sort of followed my whole life um, by those two images to realize there were actually multiple images of him. Um, and so for some reason, those two were became the popular ones that were distributed quite widely. So this is another image of Medicine Crow. And I always love to point out that crow men love to wear hair extensions um, because long hair equal power. So these are his hair extensions here. And um, I also point out that he's wearing these hair bows, but this one's actually broken. And, and uh, thinking like that, you know, I was just thinking about the personality of him to wear like a broken hair bow. He's like, whatever. <laughs> so it's supposed to look like this one. Um, and in order for him to wear those hair bows, he had to overcome an enemy and slice. So I just, another thing that I thought was quite, I, I tend to think these things are funny. It's just all these people walking around with like, uh, honest tea with uh, this guy who's a real throat slicer <laughs> made me laugh. You might've noticed too, that a lot of the men wore, um, this certain hairstyle, which is a, like a pompadour. And um, the way that they kept, kept it stiff was using white clay and thinking about them traveling with a bag of white clay um, just to get that style. And here's a closer look of that hair extension that he's wearing. As I mentioned, uh, Charles H. Barstow Here are some more drawings from that trip. They took uh, this delegation to see one of the first circuses to, to happen in the US. And so Medicine Crow drew a lot of circus animals. Um, and then because these animals didn't exist in Crow country, he 
actually kind of came up with descriptive names for them. So for instance, the peacock is wonder tale comes from above. And the writing is actually all done by Charles Barstow. And you've got the giraffe as a spotted mule. And we have a uh, catfish in our territory. And this is an elk with a big back on him. <laughs> and so I was just like really thinking about him talking to other crows and trying to describe, well, it kind of looks like an elk with like this giant back on him. And I really fell in love with these images so much so that I wanted to figure out a way like of how I could make them tangible for myself, like beyond just like staring at them on a, on a screen. And um, at that time on social media, there was an advertisement where you could take children's drawings and submit them to this company that would then turn them into a soft toy. So I got this wild idea to maybe give that a try with Medicine Crow's drawings. And so um, I liked it and I thought, well, why don't we keep, keep doing this? So here's a big snake with legs and a mountain lion or a lion in this case. Um, my favorite, the dog and man or man dog monkey. And then um, this one is so endearing to me because you can tell like he so he could remember, but for this particular zebra, he gave it dots instead of stripes. So this solo show was um, really an amazing experience for myself. And the fact that I, I ended up, you know, just asking a simple question and it took me on this incredible journey of discovery and learning. But the other really important um, experience that came out of this was a collaboration, an unexpected collaboration with my daughter who was seven at the time. So at, the, at this time I was working full time and and finding uh, any spare time to uh, make the show happen. So after work, I was working on things or during the weekend or if there was a break. And so one night, uh, you know, finish working on this show and I had a big stack of uh, um, Xerox copies of each of these chiefs. So I just like, without thinking, handed it to her and I said, you can play with these, you can entertain yourself with these and do whatever. And then I went back to doing whatever. And then she came back and plopped this drawing of Medicine Crow on my desk. And I was sort of struggling with how to like finish the story of this exhibit. And when she, she you know, presented me with this drawing, I, I thought, this is it. It really is, you know, this work is for that next generation and to have her, you know, be the next generation reinterpreting that history and owning that history. Um, I need, I need to see if she'll want to be in the show. So I asked her if she would like to part. So here she is at her, her little studio. And then she produced, I think 20 or maybe over 20 drawings of the chiefs. And then on the way to the opening, um, she came with me and she said in the car that she wants to talk about her work. And I thought, well, of course she does. Like, I can't just be talking about my work and let her not talk about her work. Um, so I let her, um, you know, talk about her work and she wanted to talk, to, talk about the stuffed animals as well. Um, and that's when I realized that she is a gifted public speaker. <laughs> And I thought, wow, like in my head at that time, I was really separating family from my art career. And um, this exhibition showed me that like, I didn't have to do that. And, and, and there was this opportunity where we could learn about her own culture and, you know, and we could also take this journey together, um, this art journey together. So from there, I'm gonna 
think we're getting close on time here, but I just decided, uh, you know, I asked if she would like to continue to collaborate. And um, we started doing a series of collaborations with different institutions in the form of like tours and various activities. So this is her giving a tour of this exhibition to her class. Um, and then uh, a few years later, we participated in this exhibition called Contemporary Native Photographers and the Edward S. Curtis Legacy. And um, we created a series of portraits. Edward Curtis, um, he photographed um, Native people at the turn of the century because um, he thought Native people were going to vanish. And so he actually came to my reservation in the early 1900s and photographed. And so with this exhibition, I had access to his portfolio of my community. And um, I wanted to produce images that I thought were sort of lacking, which was, um, we're a matrilineal society. And he didn't really focus that much on women. He focused more on the chiefs and the scouts. And so here is sort of our um, matrilineal um, photograph um, called Absalaga Feminist. And then the other thing um, was because he didn't have color technology at the time, I really wanted to show the vibrancy of um, our outfits and of our culture. Um, so here's B giving a tour of our work at that exhibition for her class again. And then from there, we did an artist residency at the Denver Art Museum. And this one, B wanted to make a tour specifically for children uh, so we set her up with like a little badge and access to the museum and to the artworks and she selected um, artworks and gave like a 30 minute tour, um, three 30 minute tours uh, of, of the different um, artworks in the Denver Art Museum collection. And she got really into this idea of being a tour guide. Um, so she drew herself an outfit and then I sewed it up for her. So here she is your tour guide outfit. I'm gonna cruise through these. Um, and actually the Denver Art Museum has a really wonderful collection of um, crow objects there. And when I was doing my research there, I actually got to see some of the original catalog cards which had these beautiful water watercolor drawings on them because they had the works works progress administration local artists to come in and draw the native collection and the african collection on the catalog cards of all the all the different objects and so i asked if i could have copies of the catalog cards with the crow objects and created this series called accession series where i um paired these objects with um, parade riders who were actually using the objects in context and in the culture. So this is a wedding blanket. This is my dad and my daughter. And here's the wedding blanket. Um, this is a crow floral um, belt. And I found this very similar floral belt that this uh, kid was using as a horse collar. So you kind of have to find these objects. This is a crow men's cuff and so he's wearing it right there and these are saddle bags beaded saddle bags and you can see right here so we're invited to the tang teaching museum and this is a work i created in 2006 called the four seasons in which um, was born out of this experience of going to a natural history museum and I went there because I was missing home and I knew I could find crow objects there. I know that's a very twisted way of thinking, but I did, I actually found some crow objects, but um, for some reason, my brain was primed in, in, in a way to kind of really question the institution. So when I walked into the Natural History Museum, um, you encountered this uh, dinosaur exhibit and it was really dramatic and dark and you walked under this brontosaurus and then through that you were led into the native galleries. And I really felt like the audience was being set up to think of native peoples as um, extinct. And so I wanted to create that feeling so I produced this work. And for this 
project at the Tang Teaching Museum, I decided B would be like an intern or an apprentice and I would have her make her own season and do exactly what I did when I made this work in 2006 and just instruct her. And so um, she picked out the backdrop and um, all the animals and uh, the flowers and then we set this season up. <laughs> this is her at the end of the day after installing the whole thing. And then with this particular project, we had, I had B ask uh, um, museum goers to pose in the in installation in the seasons and then B photograph them. So it was sort of flipped where she had the agency. And then sadly, but I think in a real power move on B's part in a good way and a, in a body way. <laughs> so um, this is her uh, at age 11. And this is our last tour, um, a project together at the Pulitzer Art Center in St. Louis. And this is her doing her last tour, some of the works on display. This is a Ruth Asawa. Is in it? So from seven to 11. And I just want to end there on that. And I'm happy to take questions if there are any. I'm clapping because <laughs> sound is, you know, I feel like it's it's horrible when people are muted, but applause is happening, Wendy, just to let you know. <laughs> I don't know how, like I see that people can do, a, a, yeah, someone did an emoji. Yeah, we can do the emoji that. too, but I, I'm so old school that I still, you know, want to clap. I, 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 yeah, I, I saw it. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> but I'm also very excited to see Vesco say so beautiful, which I couldn't agree with more. Um, yeah, folks, jump in with uh, questions. Uh, yeah, actually, I have a question. So uh, thank you for your presentation. So how do you think, uh, how do you enc encourage your daughter to uh, like get in your, involved uh, in your art uh, act active and how do you, why do you think your image about like Native Americans impact our daily life like I mean in a contemporary way thank you yes um, you know with my clever collaboration with B um, it was a, like a true collaboration even though she's a child but um, basically what would happen is if um the first one was quite easy it was sort of she was already doing the drawings and then i asked her and from there and then and then um basically if i got an opportunity i would then think maybe this might be a good fit for us to work together i would tell her about it and then she would decide if she wanted to do it or not um, and so it worked um pretty seamlessly and my job was actually to create like a very safe space for her to do her thing. Um, and, um, you know, I would kind of do all the kind of background securing. Um, but yeah, and then the thing about working with her, which I learned so much about was that um, there's a tremendous and fast growth that happens. And as adults, you know, when we hit something that's successful, we want to keep doing that. <laughs> but as kids, they're like, that's cool. And I'm ready to do something else. And so I think that was like a really powerful thing to learn. So just when she turned 11, she was like, I mean, I'm, that was cool. That was fun. Like, I'm going to now focus on like becoming my own individual person. So it, it should be interesting to see, you know, how she reflects later on in her life. And then regarding like, how is Native American culture sort of like, especially with historical, uh, focusing on historical work uh, relevant to today, it's basically for me, um, grounding. So every time I'm doing this research, I get a better understanding of why things are happening the way they are happening today. So it's truly for me, um, like a compass, a navigating compass and doing the work. And so it's, it's, it's kind of like a gateway to, to understanding. So that's why I think it's very 
impactful and, and relevant to what's directly happening to us right now, especially in these political times. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you for your time. That was really amazing. And um, I really admire the way you recontextualize the stories of the past and engage with the way the museum tells your culture story versus how you tell the story. And I was wondering what are some of the ways that the Crow community tells stories to the younger generations and to each other? And do you feel like that is an important thing to include in the way that you tell the stories? Hmm. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the question. You know, I think that the, I can't speak for all crows. I mean, <laughs> so really, I, I'm truly speaking from my sort of individual experience of growing up where I grew up and um, in my experience of participating in the culture and community. Um, but there's something so innate about being crow. And so like before, I often think about like before, like how, like I had the 1880 Crow Peace delegation, the portraits that have the red writing actually showed um, very near my reservation. So I actually had tribal members come and it, it was really struck me how many of my community members were like, I never knew any of this stuff. And I was like, yeah, I didn't either until I started digging into it. But um, there is an aspect though that is so ingrained in us in the culture. So like, for instance, that timeline, how I sort of crisscrossing and say, look, we're still doing that. It's just so embedded in us that um, it sort of continues. So I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's just a, it, it's just a way of being. Um, that can't really be taken away, which I think is amazing. And a lot of times like it's about participating. So you're talking about how, how do crows show, share the stories. To, to me, like my grandma never ever showed me how to do anything. <laughs> I was just supposed to watch her and I did, you know, and I would pick up from what she was doing and that was how, how she was teaching us. It was just through the act of doing and being. Um, so I think that's something that's really important. And so outside of settler sort of ideas of teaching. Um, so I, and I think, you know, there are things too about my work that when it's shown to a tribal member, I never have to explain certain aspects to them. They just get that. So it's sort of in this way coded in certain ways where there's aspects that if you are not a tribal member, you wouldn't really think it are funny or, or, or you wouldn't really get this or that, which is kind of another sort of added layer to the work in itself. But I, I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Aparna. Thank you so much hi. for your talk. I, I, Sedona's question relates to something I was thinking about. So I think I'll uh, tack on to that and ask you maybe um, to talk a little bit about if, like, I don't know, I was thinking about the divide, the potential divide between the, like, between your audience as in uh, Crow people, and then also like, you've shown this work in so many contemporary art contexts. So I just was interested to hear what navigating that has been like. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I went to graduate school at UCLA and that was like such an intense experience of learning about contemporary art. And I think I was, I can't remember which uh, artist I was talking today. <laughs> when I left Montana State University, I thought contemporary art was Salvador Dali. And <laughs> so when I went to UCLA and I was uh, learning about like these crazy conceptualist artists and performative artists. It was like such a steep, steep learning curve for myself. Um, and just to be honest with you, I think when I was pumped out of graduate school, um, you know, we were told like, it, 
order to become that superstar artist, the pathway was that you get, you do these top five residencies, you get into these top five group shows, you uh, get a gallery and then your gallery gets you into a museum and then you become a famous artist. <laughs> and like, I realized like that that's really, you know, I'm trying to think maybe, maybe I know two artists that I went to school with who did that, which is like unicorn uh, status. Um, that's not the path that I've taken. And so I think my goals have changed. And originally I thought like, that's what I wanted to do. But now really what I want is to do the research that I'm doing. I really feel like it's so important to, to leave this, uh, this work behind for the next generation so that they don't have to dig as hard as I had to. Um, and then they can continue it and on. And in order for me to do that, um, the system that is working for me is having the support of these sort of contemporary art institutions, not necessarily like striving for that, but that's what's happening. And it's really like, kind of like, oh, that that is then giving me access to then get back into the work that I need to do um, that is important to me. So my goal necessarily isn't to be in certain shows or whatever. Um, and that's actually really comforted me because it was too hard to play that art game. <laughs> it was way too hard and too mean and too cruel. And um, it just didn't really work with my core values. Um, so yeah, it's shifted, but it took me a few years, several years to kind of say like, it's okay. It's okay not to participate in the politics of that, of the art game in that way. I can actually work it to what I want it to do for me. Thank you. Um, I guess that actually kind of leads into a question I had. Okay. I, um, you were talking about the research you've been doing and in ensuring that you, this is easier future generations on to dive into and um, access the information that you were continually building on for yourself. and. I'm curious about like how that process has shaped up because you talked a little bit about it. Also, by the way, <laughs> I've seen some of your work in person. Um, it was a really amazing experience. Oh, thank you. You mentioned uh, Portland. Was it Portland, Maine or Portland, Oregon? Oregon. Okay. Yeah. I've seen it through other uh, museums um, advertising and at some point there's something that Maine. Okay, yeah, I don't know, I, I don't doubt that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I was really interested in how you've been going about like the support and the places you're looking at in shaping that or curving that influence to suit how you, what you're trying to preserve or. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really feel like in I think in life, you know, you have these goals like I, I, I feel like all of you have these goals of sort of the outcome of what you want through your experience you're having now. And then sometimes you reach those goals and you're you're standing on top of the mountain you're like oh shit there's like two more mountaintops, you know, <laughs> or like the people at this top of the mountain are like not what I thought they would be or hey that person got up here with a helicopter and I had to like rock climb the whole way over here um and so like that's sort of kind of what has happened with me and in my path but like I said so sort of UCLA I love UCLA I'm not trying to trash talk them but it's sort of like that was sort of the path that they said here here's the path to becoming this this art artist and what my path has been is basically um uh, it's not a, a commercial gallery path like i have friends who are in commercial gallery my path has been really like non-profit art spaces alternative art spaces and institutions and university galleries for instance i'm here talking to the university it's been quite amazing 
Um, and so I sort of, um, I think I originally was invited to have an exhibition, a solo exhibition at a university. And then through the university, they invited me to speak. And then I think from there, it just sort of bloomed where I started doing this lecture circuit. And, I, and the thing that I love about having a show at a university is I then get to do these studio visits and <laughs> talk to other artists. So that was one kind of stream of income was sort of the lecture, lecture series. And then of course, applying to grants. Uh, they don't tell you this enough in school that artists are constantly applying to different grants or fellowships or doing artist residencies that give you a studio space, maybe a stipend um, or access to equipment. Um, those are other ways to help sustain yourself. Um, I have a ton of friends who actually have these side hustles like they'll actually make uh, like jewelry or something and they'll have a whole business that like fulfills that aspect so they can make their work. And so there's all sorts of uh, ways to kind of sustain and push yourself forward to, to have, you know, a practice that isn't like this sort of gallery uh, run. Um, so yeah, I've just sort of kind of been trucking along that way. And I didn't, um, through the spaces that I was showing, I wasn't really, they were not spaces where you sell work. And I think in a way that really helped me because I never was thinking about my work in terms of selling. Um, so that sort of never kind of got in the way um, for me. And it wasn't until recently that I just started selling work. So, but I love talking about all this sort of behind the scenes of how things kind of work and how different strategies of um, making things happen. But yeah, so I'd say, you know, mine are from giving lectures to um, now selling some work and applying to grants. That's what I'm doing. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I don't have a, a video camera on my computer, but <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> <"Who's this?" laughs> I was wondering what you think about the artwork as a site of production of power and the value that's associated with an artwork and what the responsibility of the artist is to navigate that value. Can you give me an example of something that you're thinking? A more specific example? Um, maybe within an institutional setting, um, there could be a leveraging of the works value in the power dynamics of how different, well, I, I don't know. I think maybe it would be better kind of examples, but I guess just how it, the work when any viewer looks at it is creating um, an attitude shift and having an influence over people and how you're like cap capable of orienting that interest. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some weird experiences with me and I'm, I know Dwayne's had these too, <laughs> especially with the, uh, um, you know, uh, just being a native artist and showing in an institution. And there's this weird sort of um, strata line. Like um, I feel like you could look at a lot of native artists career paths and see that they've had museum exhibitions. And a lot of those museum exhibitions are through the native curator. They're not native per se, but the curators of the native art galleries. And so um, I've had with the Four Seasons, which I showed, um, which my daughter uh, did like a little apprenticeship with and made her own season. That work has been super interesting. So I made that in graduate school and then it, it hit this really, it, it caught on fire. And at one point it was showing simultaneously at eight different institutions. <laughs> it was like kind of the most crazy, ridiculous thing. But um, part of it was like, 
institutions trying to figure out where to place the work. Um, so at the Nelson Atkins, for instance, they own a set of the Four Seasons and they have a custody agreement with the Native Galleries, the Photo Gallery and the Contemporary Art Gallery and they share custody of the work. And I was like, that is like the most bizarre situation ever. <laughs> I don't know like how many other artists whose work is sort of straddles these different lines within the institution. Um, and I think, you know, the power of that work is that it, within the institution, it's critiquing the institution and the way the institution has uh, displayed or talked about Native people and Native material culture. And I think when it really blew up a few years ago, that was a very prominent discussion that was happening and that work seemed to really strike a chord for the institution. <laughs> you know, like here, here's what, you know, this voice that is missing within this institution. It's an, you know, indigenous and native perspective. Um, but that wasn't of my own, you know, that's something that happened. <laughs> it wasn't something that I had an, uh, like ever envisioned could happen. So it's, it's been kind of a surreal experience. And so I'm finding that too. I'm actually finding that with the 1880 Crow Peace delegation is kind of doing that same thing within institutions. Um, so it's not, it's not something that I consciously set out to do. It's just the timing and the, uh, the political climate that's happening and the questioning of institutions. Um, so those are things that um, I don't know if that like is going towards, you know, the question, but um, that's sort of what came up in my head uh, when you were talking. Yeah, definitely. I think it's interesting to think about how you don't necessarily feel a sense of complete control over the response that your work has. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say, Randy, that when I made that work in 2006, uh, the Four Seasons, that's what I was strongly feeling at the time. And then to like a decade later, <laughs> have it resonate and think, oh, the institution is finally catching up to what I was feeling back in 2006. And another thing with that body of work was that um, it, I didn't get a, a warm or welcoming response from my peers in graduate school, because I, I had a critique with it. And they actually thought it was very, um, they, they well, doing the work that I was doing, there were three other artists who did sort of identity-based artwork was really not in vogue. And <laughs> so we always felt like so bad for like making work about identity. Um, and we were always sort of told to kind of get over it. And so the sort of the critique around that work was like, we don't want to talk, this makes us so uncomfortable. We don't want to talk about it. Like, let's like put it away. And like, can you do something that doesn't make us have to be in that space? And so like um, for it to like kind of hit a chord, like, you know, decades later has been so interesting because it's like, I had already, I had already shifted and moved away, you know, myself and kind of like went through that journey. And so it's like, now the institution is like going through that journey. <laughs> but I've, I'm, I'm on to something else now. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I had another question. Um, on the lines of what you were talking about in terms of navigating these institutions as pieces of yours or these works of yours that suddenly gain attention later on or the institutions are um, supporting it more. I'm curious as to how the navigation or I guess the challenges of navigating that are like, your thoughts on or how 
what are some of your personal experiences in regards to that and mm -hmm. how is that informed or impact maybe yeah to, to me now i'm glad getting older is so nice <laughs> because you know, you're not worried about uh i can't wait around for an institution to finally like get it together <laughs> you know so um to me it's like that's not my concern anymore like they'll either catch up or not and that's their problem it's never that's not my problem at all so i think that's kind of where i'm at in my life it's like i need to do this piece of digging because this is really what's um, my concern at the moment. And if it strikes a chord, that's amazing. That's incredible. But I'm never wanting to have to like go what's, what's trending currently right now, you know? Um, so when the work is trending currently now that I made a decade ago, <laughs> like, okay, that's fine. Like, it's great because it's, again, to me, like that's, sort of like a means to an end it's all feeding and filtering forward and um i'm happy to you know help out in the discussion that's happening at the moment but it's also you know that support that i'm getting is helping to feed forward an, a, another project that i'm interested in um, that's vitally important to me now that might not be what everyone's focusing on right now that, that could segue me to my question, Wendy. This has been amazing, by the way. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. There's, you know, I, I think, you know, whether you're dealing with identity or making a painting, one of the, which probably, I mean, we all know is still dealing with identity because there's a whole set of privileges that go into the fact of that positionality, whatever. Um, the, um, the, um, the thing that really struck me in a couple of the pieces that you showed besides how awesome they were was um, the way in which you exhibit this resource that really, really, um, like really strong artists have. I don't know how to phrase it any other way. That you're able to pivot and improvise. And what I mean by that is the piece where you installed the, um, the um, camp um, after it had been knocked down so many times and then you put it in the football field or when you actually sort of enlisted your, or rather your daughter enlisted herself, I won't <laughs> decide who did what or whatever there. Like, careful, but, she's um, in the back room, yeah. she's 13 now, you just don't want to mess with her. <laughs> exactly, but that you were able to sort of, you know, I mean, I'm assuming that you'd been planning and working on these pieces for months and then this sort of unexpected thing happened and that rather than be like, oh, this doesn't align with my intentions or the way that this thing should be presented or perceived, this is an opportunity. And so I wanted to phrase, frame that, which I think is pretty much one of the best powers that an artist has is to improvise and to pivot and to, and to, and to, um, and not to be, I mean, to be intuitive, but, but to be able to adjust and see the work through these circumstances um, in a really kind of rapid fire way. Um, what are you working on now? And has an, is there another example like that that's already happened in your research now? Like um, I think that's like why I'm so addicted to working with archives and collections um, because um, I've just learned humility. <laughs> And just to like really humble my sort of sometimes very narrow thinking of the way things are and should be. Um, and so I'm, you know, constantly kind of running into that when I'm doing research where I'm like, well, this must be this way because of whatever sort of ideas I've grown up with or whatever. And then I, I actually dig below the surface and, in, and it's something that's totally far beyond and like more wonderful than what I had imagined. Kind of like when, you know, I had been participating in the parade and never asked why. And I'm like, that, that's why we're doing it. That's like, so it's just magical in a way. Um, so I think that's what kind of what attracts me to doing the sort of digging into these collections and uh, historical photos and learning about like the different like 
scenarios around like how this one image exists and this moment in time exists and sort of the agendas of like the people behind them and in them. Um, and so I'm working on a project that's supposed to open at the Jocelyn Museum in January. It's another research project um, in Omaha, Nebraska, which um, in 1898, they had the Trans Mississippi Exposition. It was a way for Omaha to kind of um, bring in like, um, bring in like uh, attract business um, and sort of they uh, mimicked uh, a world's fair. It's kind of like their idea of a world's fair. And as part of that, they invited over um, 500 native people to come and they built an Indian village and they called it the Indian Congress. And there was a photographer named Reinhardt who photographed, there's over 500 portraits of these different native delegations that came. And one of the delegations was Crow. And so, um, and along with that, they had like the, you know, the Iowa building, they had the car, um, Egypt building or whatever, you know, and you could go in and there's all these archives of the photos of the displays. So like Iowa had a bunch of like corn you know, and things like that. And so, um, but I was just thinking, you know, one of the reasons why they brought the Indian Congress is because they knew like they could get, get a lot of money because people want to see native people and the wild west and sort of the, buy into that romanticism. And so the concept for that show I actually have some images here. Let me, let me grab them real quick. Um, is to take the Reinhardt photos and actually build like, like the display, like they displayed a lot of the fruits and produce, um, a display like that, but on that display to have the various like native delegations that were there and, and place them on the shelf. So I've just been cutting over 500 image. This is uh, Lewis, he's flathead. This is Paul. And the amazing thing, this is Catherine, is Moses. And the amazing thing is that this photographer actually wrote all their names and their tribal affiliations. This is a, another image of Paul. So you can see this sort of kind of doing that um, ethnographic thing where they photographed them um, front side, sometimes the back of them. And yeah, so that's a big project. So there'll be a display and you walk in and you'll see the entire Indian Congress. Because for me, I've seen the Reinhardt photos, but it's just been like looking at them in a book or online. But I really wanted to feel the gravity of having 500 souls, you know, with their names that you can walk into a room and they'll all be there. But in the, this kind of real fucked up scenario of commodification of like, capitalism i mean in a panopticon uh, in many ways like yeah but yeah this is fun because on um you know i've worked so much with my community and just to have the honor to be able to like learn more about these other native nations um and the it's the uh jocelyn is inviting the native communities around to come and to participate and, and, and talk about their own delegations. So that's that's really exciting for me. But yeah, so um, my fingers are sore. I'll probably get arthritis after this project. <laughs> but, but yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a nice, nice distraction to have, especially during this time period. It doesn't seem like a distraction at all and we're excited. <laughs> I mean, I'm excited. I'm sure everybody is excited too. Wow. Anybody else? Um, hi, Wendy. I was just wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about more about 
yeah, yeah. like different audiences and sort of like the levels that goes into that. Um, sorry, I think my internet's unstable. I don't know if you can hear me, but um, yeah, I caught that. But yeah, I'm just wondering. About, okay, yeah, I'm just wondering about that, like whether because um, you spoke about how like people from your community would notice certain things about the work that um, a wider audience wouldn't. So I'm curious, like, do you ever um, run into things where I don't know, like miscommunications or where you think like some people are gonna catch something and they don't or um, just, I don't know what that experience is like. Yeah, that's a great question. I think as a graduate student or like a stu an art student, um, that was one of the things, like the question is like, who's your audience? And um, <laughs> uh, also getting feedback that like, you know, maybe you're being too specific in, in, in your, um, focusing on the, on your own community and that that can't be relatable to people outside of that community. But I've never ever found that actually to be an issue um, because really deep down what the work is about is about humanizing and humanity. And these are all relatable human experiences. Um, so to me, it, that's never been a problem. And that's the issue, right? Is that we're not treating native people as humans. Um, so that's it. So any wall or anything where you're uncomfortable or uh, not you, but like someone who has like an issue, it's their issue. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's really about people and, and having empathy and caring about people. And um, it's not siloed. This is your history. This history that I'm sharing is not Crow history. It's, it's our history. And so that's really what I want um, it's relatable, <laughs> you know, for all those reasons. And just so anytime like people feel uncomfortable about race, like it has everything to do with you because we are people and, and we need to be kind and relate to each other. <laughs>